Thank you, worship team. That was, we could close the service off right now. <laughs> but we're not going to. Oh, yeah. Children, you're dismissed for Kids Quest. Have a good time. Learn something really special today, okay? As we were singing that previous song about eternal hallelujah and worshiping forever, I remind, it reminded me, for some reason this flashed into my head, there was an old Far Side cartoon many years ago now, Terry Larson, probably was not a believer, a lot of those cartoons were cute and funny, but sometimes they were not so good, but this one depicted a man sitting on a cloud, obviously he was in heaven, and the guy was just actually bored out of his skin. He was doing absolutely nothing, maybe twirling his thumbs, and he looked off in the sky, and, and the caption was, I, sh I knew I should have brought a magazine. <laughs> he had no concept of what eternity will be like. And I don't think we do either for sure, but God has it all figured out. One day we'll be with him forever, and we'll be worshiping forever. We'll never get old. We'll never grow tired. For worshiping our Lord and our God. Amen. It was 50 years ago and more. I was in college over in Ellensburg, Washington, at Central Washington University. And one quarter I took a class in astronomy. Not astrology, but astronomy. There's a big difference between the two. I took an astronomy class. They had a, an observatory on campus there for the science department. And one night during that class, on a clear, cloudless night, our class got to go up into the observatory and take a peek at our solar system. It had a fairly powerful telescope. I assume it's probably still there today. But anyway, that was the highlight of the, of the quarter for me, to go up there and, and look through a telescope and to see our solar system. The, the planet Saturn was there in all its splendor. Trust me, folks, I saw it. It is there. It's, it's spectacular. But the only thing I remember from that class 50 years ago was just this one thought the instructor said. Keep in mind, 50 years ago, scientists estimated that there were probably 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And there were probably 100 billion galaxies the same size as our galaxy. That's 100 billion, 100 billions. Folks, that is a big number. Don, you were a math teacher. That's a big number, isn't it? That's a big number. But you know, that was 50 years ago. Today, scientists will say that there are probably closer to 300 billion stars in our galaxy and 300 billion galaxies the same size as our galaxy, which is even a bigger number. I was never a math major, but I know that's got to be a big, big number. And I think if scientists are really honest today, if they, every time they discover something new out in the universe, probably the one thing they really learn is that how little they actually know. When you consider all the universe out there, they are having scratched the surface of what God has um, laid out before us. In Romans chapter 1, God has revealed himself through what we call general revelation. God has, through his creation, through what we see around us on earth, what we see up in the sky at night, what we have all around us that God has created, his general revelation. The Bible says that with just that much alone, man is without excuse. In fact, in Psalms it says, a man who disclaims God, a man who says there is no God, is a fool. Amen. It is beyond me how someone can look out through the world and see the trees and the mountains and the rivers and the ocean and the animals and then look at our own body and, and then ponder how many cells we have that replace themselves every day. How many miles and miles of, of capillaries we have inside the human body and how we just came here somehow just through evolution. It's somehow we just appeared. Right. It's beyond me. How can someone say there is no God? 
The Bible also reveals special revelation to each and every one of us. God's written word right here. Amen. God's written word and the life of Jesus Christ himself. God's special revelation. And so we know even more about our Heavenly Father. And you know, the more and more we study God's word, the more we understand our God. And yet at the same time, I must say that there is much about God that we don't understand. There's a lot of things about God that we can't understand. We are not meant to understand, at least not this side of eternity. Some things about God we just cannot explain. I think one of the greatest mysteries of all is the Trinity. We've been singing about the Trinity this morning. Another word for Trinity is the Godhead. So I'll use the two interchangeably this morning. Trinity and Godhead are the same thing. How can God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be three persons and yet be one? I can't explain it, nor can you. Our, our finite little minds cannot grasp that total concept. And yet, that's okay, because God has it figured out. The main thing for us to do is just to trust Him, because God knows what He's doing. Amen. Now, don't get your hopes up. I'm not going to stand up here this morning and, and explain to you everything there is about the Trinity. That's not going to happen. In fact, I'm hoping that one day one of you will come and explain it to me. So then I will know and understand. But we are going to spend some time this morning looking at, looking at the Holy Spirit. Part of the Trinity, part of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Maybe the part of the Godhead that we do not understand as well. But today and next Sunday we're going to look at the Trinity, at the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us a great deal about the Holy Spirit. And the deeper we go in this study, the more exciting it becomes. And it's my hope and my prayer that you will be excited about this too as we learn more and more about the Holy Spirit. Its duties, who the Holy Spirit is, where the Holy Spirit is, and do we have the Holy Spirit ourselves? So, who or what is the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit just a nebulous, abstract concept out there somewhere? Is the Holy Spirit just an it? Or is the Holy Spirit a he? You know, we use metaphors all the time in our everyday language. Metaphors help communicate whatever it is we want to say. For instance, if someone is, say, they are up to their eyeballs in stress, they are maxed out as far as pressures and stress, we might say that they are a basket case. That's a metaphor. Or if someone has a perfect world going on, nothing, no problems of any kind, you might say that they are on top of the world. That's a metaphor. We use metaphors all the time to describe and to help um, communicate what it is we want to say. There are metaphors throughout Scripture as well that help describe and depict our Father and our Son and our Holy Spirit. God is said to be our refuge and protector. Psalm 17 says that we can hide safely under His wing. The Bible also calls God a consuming fire. So based on that, is God a mother hen? Is God a blast furnace? No, of course not. Jesus himself called himself the bread of life. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Does this mean that Jesus is a loaf of bread? Or was he a, heap, a sheep herder? Somebody please say no. no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, all right, you're with me. We see in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is described as living water. Or, sometime, or a, as a form, in the form of a dove a, a descended on Jesus the time he was baptized. At Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, we'll look at this next week. The Holy Spirit is pictured as a violent wind from heaven and as tongues of fire. All of these are metaphors that help describe the Godhead, the character of God. So the Holy Spirit is not an it. 
Jesus made it very clear to his disciples that the Holy Spirit, when it comes, the Holy Spirit will teach, he will show, he will glorify, he will reveal the future, he will comfort, the Holy Spirit will encourage, he will bring healing, he will convict, he will intercede, and he will give power. And it's not even limited to, to those things there. Far, far more than even that. Amen. Jesus told the disciples that when he returned to his Father, when he was, would ascend into heaven again, he would send another advocate, a comforter, and an intercessor, a helper, to replace him. The Holy Spirit is much more than just merely a force or a power. He is in the personage of God himself because the Holy Spirit is God. He has a distinct personality. He has many duties that he carries out in your life and in mine. The Holy Spirit must be pretty busy. It would be a full-time job just living inside of me. And then he has all of you as well. Oh my. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> We're going to look at John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17. He should be up on the wall behind me. This is spoken by Jesus to his disciples in the upper room. It's called the upper room discourse. This is just hours before Jesus is arrested, before he's gone through a, a monkey court type of trial, and then crucified. It's that same evening, just before that all takes place. Jesus is giving his disciples instructions. And here in John 14, it's written in red, so I know it's extra important. But Jesus says this to his disciples, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus said, told his disciples that he would send another advocate. The word another there refers to specifically another of the very same kind. In other words, this advocate that was going to come, this Holy Spirit that was going to come, was going to be a perfect substitute for Jesus himself. He would be exactly like God the Son. One who was, had been with them, but now when the Holy Spirit comes, he will also be in you. Not only with you, but in you. And for how long will he be in us? Forever. So how does this person of the Holy Spirit do that? How does the Holy Spirit dwell inside of me and dwell inside of you and dwell, actually dwell in the side, inside of hundreds of millions of believers around the world all at the same time? How can he do that? I can't explain it. You can't explain it. But I know God has it figured out. But that doesn't make it any less true either, does it? The Holy Spirit is in us today. Where it's very, very clear in God's Word. God can do anything and everything that He chooses to do because He is God. I don't understand gravity, and yet I know it's there. Every time I drop something, I'm reminded once again that gravity is still there. Mm -hmm. I don't make a habit of jumping off the buildings because I know that gravity is all around. I tried that a couple times as a younger man, and I gotta tell you, I didn't bounce. <laughs> I splat. <laughs> I also don't make a habit of putting my finger into a light socket. Because I know it because I know that electricity is also there. And I really don't care to experience electricity quite that personally. I, I believe that, pers that electricity and gravity are both there. I believe that, and yet I cannot explain them. And the Bible shows us many things about the Holy Spirit, some that we cannot explain. But the, the Holy Spirit has many attributes attributes of personhood and many of those attributes you and I have as well we're going to look at those next week but for today we're going to look at um, 
divine attributes of the Holy Spirit. If we had more time, we'd go through the entire thing today. You want to do that? You want to pull an all, all nighter tonight? <laughs> I haven't done one of those since college. But maybe we'll wait until next week for the second part. But today we'll look at the divine attributes of the Holy Spirit. Attributes that you and I do not have because we are not deity. We know that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, or the Godhead. Ezekiel 11, verse 24 says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. In Acts 16, 7, Luke says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. Luke takes that even further in Acts chapter 5 with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Let's look at that just for a moment. Acts chapter 5. This is obviously after Jesus has already ascended again and the first century church is just getting underway. Now a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge he kept back part of the money for himself but he brought the rest and laid it and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Not only had Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, but they had lied to God. Which shows us again that the Holy Spirit is God. Now you know the story here. You know what happens to Ananias and Sapphira. They both die right there on the spot. Not because they held back some money. If they had done that and came and had come and given the portion that they gave and say, this is what we have to give, we kept some for ourselves, that would have been perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. God has never asked us to sell and give every single thing that we have. It's perfectly fine. It's legal in every way to hold back a portion for yourself. But that's not what they did. They came with the, the story that they were giving everything. They were lying to God. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. And that's a very serious offense. And it cost them their lives right there on the spot. So there are four divine attributes of the Holy Spirit that we obviously do not have. You can follow along with your outline there. It's in the bulletin. The first one. The Holy Spirit is eternal. Even before creation, the Godhead has always been. It is impossible enough to try to imagine that eternity future will never end. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amen. Those are great words. Yes. Somebody ought to come up with some song, some music, and put that yeah. in a song. <laughs> Close your eyes for just a second, not for too long, I don't want you to nod off, but try to think of the absolute biggest number that you can come up with, a number that will relate to eternity. See if you can come up with a number bigger than what Don will be able to come up with, a math teacher. Whatever number you come up with, you're not even close. It's not nearly big enough. You might throw a couple millions and billions in there, trillions and quadrillions. You might want to add a zillion or maybe a kajillion, whatever, to try and explain or depict how long eternity will be. Not even close. Eternity will have no end. It's kind of like the Energizer Bunny that just keeps going on and on and on and on. There's a pastor in, in Chicago, Erwin Lutzer. Mm -hmm. You probably recognize the name. He's on Moody Radio quite often, every day. 
He is the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago. Erwin Lucer has written a number of books. One of them is this one right here, One Minute After You Die. And in here, there's a, a small portion where Lucer is trying to explain for us with finite minds, how long is eternity? <clears throat> Here's what he writes. How long is eternity? Visualize a bird coming to the earth every million years and taking one grain of sand to a distant planet. At that rate, it would take thousands of billions of years before that bird could carry away a single handful of sand. Now let's expand that illustration and think how long it would take that same bird to move. Now I'm going to change the term here so we can, re we can relate to this in Priest River. He talks about the Oak Street Bridge in Chicago, but we've never been there. So if that bird was to take away all the sand in the mud hole <laughs> or Rally Creek over in the Macle, we can relate to those. How long would it take for that bird to remove the beach at Rally Creek in the Clee, and then the other thousands of beaches around the world. After that, the bird could begin on the mountains and the earth's crust. By the time the bird transported the entire earth to the off, far off planet, eternity would not have even officially begun. Strictly speaking, one cannot begin an infinite series, for a, be a beginning implies an end. In other words, we might say that after that bird has done his work, those of us in eternity will be not even one step closer to having eternity end. There is no such thing as half an eternity. Can you understand all that? I can't. But that's okay. God's got to figure it out. Now try to wrap your finite mind around this. What's even more impossible than eternity future is that there was no eternity past for God. God has always been. He never began. And I say it's even more impossible. That's kind of an oxymoron. Because if it's impossible, it's impossible. It can't be more impossible than impossible because impossible is impossible. <laughs> It's kind of like if I had something in my hand that was absolutely, totally, completely perfect. And I have something in this hand that's even more perfect. You can't have more than just perfect. It's already perfect. And so with eternity past, it's, it, it's just too much for us to fathom. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes of heaven in what awaits us as, be, as believers. We're going to read uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 5. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a, de as a deposit, guarantee guaranteeing what is to come. It says here that the Holy Spirit inside of us is our deposit. He's our guarantee of eternity to come because the Holy Spirit himself is eternal. Number two, another attribute of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is omniscient. You might want to look at the wall up here behind me to get the correct spelling for omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing. There it is. It's spelled correctly. Omniscient, all-knowing. That sure isn't you, and it sure isn't me. Occasionally, we might refer to somebody that we know. Somebody we maybe we've met, we say, oh, he's a know-it-all. Know and when you stop to think about it, that's really kind of a ridiculous thing to say. It's kind of laughable when you think about it. The teeny tiny little bit that I know, I keep forgetting. <laughs> I hope someday, I know someday that no one will ever call me a know-it-all. I just hope they don't call me a forget-it-all. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He knows everything. First Corinthians. 
chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Paul writes this. These are the and these are the things God has revealed. Now by these things he's referring to God's nature, his truth, his plan for salvation, the life and death of Jesus Christ, his plan for mankind, all the things about God kind of encompass all together. These things. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God. And He knows the thoughts of God the Father. One of my very favorite chapters in the entire Bible I probably said this before, I'm sure I have. Psalm 139. Psalm written by David. David throughout that chapter speaks over and over again of the divine attributes of God and of the Godhead. Look with me at Psalm 139. <clears throat> Verses 1 through 6. We'll begin there. David writes this, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know, you, Lord, know it completely. Is that a scary thought? <laughs> God knows exactly what you are going to say before you even have thought of it. That should be pretty sobering at times. I keep reminding myself of that. Boy, shouldn't have, shouldn't have even thought of saying that. God already knows my heart. Verse 5, You hem me in before, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. This is our all-knowing, omniscient God. Number three, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Omnipresent means that the Holy Spirit is everywhere all of the time. There are times when my wife Patty will say to me, Oh, I need to be in three different places right now. <laughs> but you know, she can't pull that off any more than you can. <laughs> and that we're already talking about three places. And now we're talking about the Holy Spirit being absolutely everywhere at all times because he is omnipresent. Look what David writes on in, in chapter 139 of Psalm, verses 7 through 12. David writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will, be, will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. Number four, the fourth divine attribute of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. You might want to check the spelling of that one too. Omnipotent, that means all-powerful. The creator of everything that ever has been or ever will be. Kings and nations all throughout the Old Testament tested one time and time and time again the power of God, thinking that they could could match whatever God could match. Never happened. God is all powerful. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, right from the get go, right at the first words out of the box. God has written 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit was right there with the Godhead for all of creation. Only God can create. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, John was telling a story here about some scientists that were challenging God to a contest to see who could create and who could create the best. Well, the, the scientists were very confident in what they thought they were going to be able to create until God said, uh-uh, get your own dirt. <laughs> no, just between you and me, I don't think that story was true. <laughs> and yet our pastor told us that story. Now, are we supposed to be able to believe our pastor? <laughs> Now, an elder, that might be something different, but for the pastor, you should be able to believe him. But that was the point he made. That man cannot create. Only God can create. Right. We're going to look at Psalms again. This time, Psalm chapter 8. Verses 1 to 4. Speaking of God's Ability to be powerful, omnipotent. Psalm 8, verses 1 to 4. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Do you recognize those words from a song? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sandy Patty sang that probably 30, 35, 40 years ago. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Yeah. Yeah, run, run. Love that song. And here it is in Psalm, in Psalm chapter 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foal and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Now what, you, what David is saying here about God's creation, the, the immense universe out ahead of us, the world we see all around us, how can God that created all of that and still want a personal relationship with you and with me? And yet we know as we study our Bible, as we know through our relationship with Jesus Christ that He longs very much to have that relationship with us. Not only has God created everything that is as big as big can be, but He has also created everything that is as small as small can be. When you consider the human body, all the cells that we replace every single day, everything about us that we are so intricately made, God is a God of largeness and of smallness at the same time. Back to Psalm 139. Verses 13 through 18 now. David writes this, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. I hope I'm not the only one that's actually wowed by our Almighty, Almighty God. Yes, when we consider a sovereign Lord and God who created everything, including you, including me, how He longs for a relationship with us. He wants for us to be with Him forever in eternity. 
2 Peter 3 9 says that God is not um, willing that any should die, but that all should have eternal life. We looked at the beginning of the Holy Spirit's attributes today. Those things that we cannot possess because we are not God. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit. It'll, it'll be uh, a lot of things next Sunday. You might want to bring an overnight bag with you. <laughs> we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit came, and why, and when, and for whom, and then what does the Holy Spirit do? And what are some of the duties, and some of, some of the things that the Holy Spirit does within you and within me? It's a great study. Hope to see you next week. Would you pray with me, please? <coughs> Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Father, we worship you, we adore you. We come before you humbly with nothing to offer but ourselves. We are so undeserving of you, and yet you love us immensely. Father, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is with us today, that is indwelling us right now as we speak, and will remain with us until we go home to be with you. Father, when we really grasp hold of the truth, of who you are and what you want to do in our lives. We just worship you. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.